Today we meet a man who stood as CEO of a fitness industry icon for over a decade, pioneering the pay-as-you-go and low-cost models in the UK. Within three years, the company made its first million pound profit and our guests continue to drive success. Investing in his people, donating to charity and becoming the first health club business listed on the London Stock Exchange for over 12 years. Please join me in welcoming founder, director of the Gym Group, John Traherne to the Escape in Amits podcast. Welcome, John. Morning. Well, was I correct in that introduction? There's... Yep, I'm afraid so, yes. <laughs> See, it only seems a few minutes ago, though, we started it all. Really? Had a great journey. Yeah. So, so what does it feel like kind of moving from, I guess, CEO in, in, in the driving seat to kind of um, what, founding partner? Is that, is that your new... Yeah, very much so. I mean, clearly, I mean, retiring would drive me absolutely bonkers, and certainly my wife isn't keen on the idea at all. So. <laughs> Um, I, I'm keen to be involved. Um, my role is definitely changing. I'm seeing myself beginning to mentor the next generation, helping new people coming into this sector and within our own business. So I see myself doing a lot more of that, um, but very much sort of passing over the CEO role to Richard Darwin, um, who I've been working with um, since before the IPO in 2015. Right, but you're still here, new club, very hands-on, which is absolutely, nice to see. <laughs> absolutely, and and our first venture into the city of London. So Brilliant. we have loads of investors who work around here. So um, I'm expecting. In fact, I bumped into one in the changing room, who was. Uh, so it's good to see some of our investors actually have joined uh, the the gym here at Monument. Right. Is, is, so this is the first one actually in the, in the actual city itself, is it? Yeah, we've done a lot of gyms in Greater London. Um, we're the largest low-cost gym operator in London. Um, but most of our sites tend to be uh, going out towards the M25, the North and South Circular. So places like from Vauxhall to Streatham, um, you know, that type of location and moving out as far as Croydon. I mean, we've got two very successful sites in Croydon. Right. Is that because of the economics of building somewhere in a central location doesn't work for a low cost facility? Um, clearly, property costs are very different, uh, as, you, as I'm sure you can imagine, around uh, this sort of location. Um, so it is partly property costs that make it difficult. Um, the other factor is also the sort of work and um, living balance. So one of our most popular uh, membership categories is our Live It membership. And part of that enables you to use any gym anywhere you like. And the most popular part of it is where people are using two or more gyms. So you may live in Guildford, you've got an office near Vauxhall or Waterloo, um, you can pay a little bit more and that gives you access to all of our London gyms right. in addition to one near your home in Guildford. Yeah. And does the, do the pricing models change as you get into central London compared to outside or are they pretty similar? Yes, inevitably. I mean, you've got higher costs of operation. I mean, it, it's more driven by the competitive market. I mean, gyms in London are more expensive than they are in Liverpool. Um, and our pricing throughout the country reflects that. Um, so each of our gyms, we look at pricing very much on a local basis, um, based on competition, the state of the economy. And because we're really beginning to change the market, I mean, even in our oldest gym, 41% of the people joining last year told us they've never been a member of a gym before. So we're attracting a new market. And like so many other businesses, low cost is what's driving growth. Right. And why, why, do, you think, um, why, why do you think low cost is so important? Do you, do you think sort of, because you've been in the industry as we talked before for quite some time, do you, do you think that people feel um, that fitness, you know, shouldn't be as expensive as probably what it was 10 or 15 years ago? Or do you, do you think it, you know, bringing the 
cost down makes it easier for people, like you say, who haven't been working out before to, to get involved in it. What, what's your thoughts on that? I think it's a number of factors, and certainly I don't think it's all about price, but inevitably price is a big driver. And, in, and having been involved in this sector since the early 90s, um, price has always been a big driver to people's choice. Convenience is equally as, as important. I think we've added a number of new dimensions to that, though. 24 <clears throat> 7 operation, so all of our gyms are open. Do loads of people work out at 3 a.m.? No, but you can if you want to. But what's more important, if you want to work out at midnight, 1 o'clock, or you can't sleep and you want to work out at 5 a.m., you can. Most gyms don't offer that facility. And it helps attract part of a new market, shift workers. So, you know, people who work in bars, restaurants, casinos, hotels, etc. Taxi drivers probably one of the biggest markets in that area for us. We're just open all the time. You know, taxi drivers feeling, you know, he's got a quiet period or whatever it is, he can just go into one of our gyms, have a workout and then go back to work. Right, right. So what, what was it like when you came in the industry? We go back to the sort of early, was, was Dragons your first sort of venture you did or did it start before then? It was the first venture I did on my own. Right. Um, um, borrowed a lot of money against my house to, to do the first one. So, well, so, so what, well, you owned your house and then you went to the bank and tried to get a loan? Was it? Yeah, I mean, today you wouldn't be able to do that because <laughs> banks don't let you do that sort of thing anymore, but they did let me. and. I borrowed money against the house and enabled me to open the, the first concept. I mean, Dragons, which was the business then, was a very different type of business. It was family orientated. It was based around actually one of my passions, which is squash. I used to play squash for England. Um, and that's actually how I sort of got into the sector. So we were buying existing squash clubs that weren't working, and then we converted some of the squash courts into swimming pools, gyms, studios, and so on. Very commonplace today, but back in 1990, they didn't exist. Um, very similar path, actually, to the gym group. So um, having got the first one up and running, um, I then managed to get private equity backing from Lazard Ventures and Ber um, Questa Capital Management to then roll the concept out. Four years later, we floated on AIM um, and ultimately ended up selling the business in year 2001. Right. Uh, so similar time scale, interestingly, um, and a similar path. With, with Dragons, how long, how long did it take you from when you started? Did, did you sell it eventually, that, that group? Yes, we, we sold it largely because we had two major shareholders <coughs> who uh, were fixed life funds and they had to wind the funds up. So really selling the business was the only real sort of option for them. Right. Very different today because we're on, we're on the full market. Um, we're owned predominantly by large city institutions who have a, a long-term view on investment. So, um, you know, we won't end up doing the same thing. Yeah. How many clubs did you get up to in, in, in the Dragons group? Yeah, that was the other big difference. So uh, we got to 22. Um, of course, in a market where there weren't health clubs and we were growing, you know, opening one a year. Um, today we open 20 a year or thereabouts. Um, and we're currently sort of heading towards 155 gyms and heading towards a million members. So very different type of environment yeah. from the early 90s. What would you say are some of the things that you, or, or were there any things that you took and learned from that experience of building a chain of 20 to what you're doing now? Uh, very definitely. I mean, I was a lot younger then, um, so I was learning a lot about business, um, how to build a business successfully. I think one of the major things I also learnt that you can be passionately 
attuned to your business, but the most important thing is you need to run it as a business. So I probably in the early days was you know, really into running you know, this fantastic uh, business that was growing rapidly and I was enjoying it and playing squash regularly and all the rest of it. <clears throat> I think that's what I've learned that you know, most people go bust because they run out of cash and practical things like that. Um, so certainly learned an awful lot. Learned a lot about um, how to manage private equity investors um, and obviously having floated a company twice. Um, that's a very interesting experience um, and very different today than it was you know, back in um, 1997 when we floated last time. Yeah, and, and, and talking about investment then, would you, obviously you've chose that route twice. You know, if, you, if you went back to the Dragons days, do you think that's, you know, is that a good way to grow business? You know, if someone else is coming in and opening a club and they wanted to expand, is that a good way? Are you giving up a lot of what you own to do that? Or is that something that's required to build a business where it's quite capital, capitally in, in, intensive? Um, I think that's, you, you hit the nail on the head with the last comment that setting up health clubs is not cheap and normally speaking is beyond the realms of one individual. I mean, I <clears throat> managed to fund a site, but I needed additional capital to roll out and build a chain of them. Um, if, if I had the money personally, uh, yes, of course, I'd love to have kept 100% of the equity, but that's not viable. And the other thing I think is really important is that if you've got a new concept and you're first in the market, you need to grow it quickly because inevitably people copy you. We, there are lots of people who've tried to copy us. They're not very successful at it, but it doesn't stop them trying. And therefore you need to stay ahead of the market. Again, if you don't have cap capital, it's very difficult to do that. Right. And, and you mentioned about getting, again, just sticking with dragons for a moment, you mentioned about the passion and enjoying the running. Did, were you, did you mean by that then that sometimes your sort of love of the business and what you're doing overrides the sort of rational, look, you know, we've got to make money and keep this, you know, this is a business as opposed to a passion project. Is that, is that what you were referring to? Yes. <clears throat> I mean, I think ideally you want the balance of might. I mean, you know, I love what I do. Uh, I have, we've had a fantastic journey over the last 10 years. We've seen um, some people start with us as personal trainers who now, you know, regional managers or above within the organization. So it's been a great experience, you know, for the people working in it, certainly not just for me. But I think, you know, the, <clears throat> that business element has to be at the back of it. Um, so ideally you need both. You need right. the passion for what you do, but, but with the business side as well. And would you say, because we've, we've been in, and we are in the situation, I love the business I'm in, but sometimes you kind of have to make a decision, well, you know, do you just do it because you think you're passionate about it? You know, do you spend that extra money on doing it because you love it? Or it's like, no, you know, <laughs> this is business. You've got to stick to the guidelines. And my, my, my guess is in the business you run nowadays, you're quite disciplined with those decisions is it um yeah I, I personally i think it's vital you are so let, let me give you an example of that so if we're refurbishing a gym we will talk of course to our managers about what what they feel their gym needs what new gym equipment it may or may not need um, but that isn't enough for us because we want to talk to the customer obviously as well and also to customers who aren't members because there may be something we're doing that's stopping them joining because we don't have the right facilities. So we consult with all, all of those elements and then we use science to actually monitor the usage of the gym equipment and so on. So over the last 10 years, we've seen the market evolve. It hasn't changed radically, but today we would have more free weight equipment in our gyms functional equipment, we will have less treadmills, but the treadmill is still the most popular machine we have in our whole estate. So it's changed, it's evolved, 
not particularly radically, but we've reflected that in when we've rebranded the whole company over the last couple of years. All of that has changed. So the room you're sitting in now with all these spinning bikes, you wouldn't have seen 10 years ago, whereas you'll see it everywhere today. Yeah, so it's really making decisions based on what's right for the staff and for the customer as opposed to something that you just happen to be, you know, if you're a squash player or a runner, um, you, I guess you've got to put those things to a side if you're actually running and, and driving a business forward, I guess. Well, I mean, if you took 10 years ago, I mean, most women would not use free weights because they were convinced they ended up getting bulky as a result, which they didn't want. So that's what happened. Today, there obviously is much more science about the way train, people train. So what do we find? We find people want more free weights, more benches, but they don't want heavier free weights. Actually, they want more light free weights. And that is helping us sort of grow the female market in our gyms. Right, interesting. So I suppose inevitably that's one thing I've certainly learned is the customer um, is obviously vital to any business. But probably even more important are the people who work for you or with you. Um, because that's a key part of how you keep your gyms different. Um, so I, I was in Orlando speaking at a conference last week and the Disney Institute were talking and they were saying exactly the same thing about Disney, that one of the most popular rides is 39 years old. Space Mountain is 39 years old and is still as popular today as it has ever been. But the most popular thing that the customers like in their hotel, wait for this one, I was fascinated by this, is <clears throat> the fact that the room staff make a different animal out of a towel every day. And the kids come back and they want to see what animal's on the bed today. <laughs> Costs absolutely nothing to do other than of some good training. But again, just sort of emphasizes that successful businesses aren't all about the hard product, they're much more about the people who run them, the personality they have. And that's why we have such a big focus. I mean, you talk, talk about the fact we're the only listed business in the sector. <clears throat> I'm probably as proud about the fact we're the only one with the Gold Investors in People Award that nobody in our sector has. Um, so that's an emphasis. Um, that <clears throat> has certainly been sort of part of this business right from day one. Right. And, and was that, it, it, I guess, was that a strategic part of your concept when you decided to create this then? To, to, because, you, you know, I, I travel around gyms all over the world and, you know, like, I, I noticed straight when I came here, there was a guy at the front. I'm, I'm not sure whether that was planned, but, you know, he was made nice, made comments, um, you know, he didn't, know what I was here for but you know I got a nice instant experience um, and my view of um, general low-cost gyms is you, you know you don't really see many people you don't see a smile you just kind of come in and come out on your own so I guess first impressions was you know this the people um. and it, it's like going to a good restaurant I mean it's partly about the food of course but it's also about how you're greeted you know if you've come back again it's nice to be remembered um, those are the little soft things that actually make the experience very different. And most people get it wrong. Yeah. Um, but then there are some basic things. I mean, we're fastidious about things like cleaning and keeping our gym equipment well maintained. I mean, you talk to our gym manufacturers, we are hell to work for because we are very demanding on them. You know, they have to fix gym equipment when it breaks down within 48 hours. And if they don't, it costs them money. Um, so, <clears throat> but that's not because I'm a pain in the ass. It, it's because we're trying to ensure that we're pro providing the right level of service for our members. Yeah. How do you drive that on the, on the people and culture side? What, what are some of the things that you do probably that others may not do? Don't run it from the center. So empower local management. So right from day one, I, in fact, I have a, a, my old chairman 
uh, who was sort of my mentor, who's today 95 years of age, I always remember him saying he ran 265 hotels worldwide. And I always remember him saying to me, you cannot run a business of that with different time differences and language and so on from London. You have to employ the best management you can afford and then let them run their business. My guess is if you independently went and chatted to one of our managers and asked him how he saw his job, I would hope the most common answer would be, I love running my business, because that actually is what we want them to do. So we give them the tools to do that. Of course, there are you know, certain guidelines they have to work within, but they can make decisions and we empower them. So what we don't try to do is run it all from our central office in East Croydon. Um, and therefore, we don't always do the same thing. I mean, marketing, for instance, a gym in Brighton isn't the same as Leeds or Edinburgh. And therefore, you need to have a, you know, even though you can have a certain degree of centralization, um, buying is better done that way, for instance. <clears throat> but actually, what you do and how you do it is better driven by the local teams. So a good example of that is the work we do for charity. I mean, we raise a lot of money for charity. We've just supported the Movember campaign. Um, our team, run by them, ran over, uh, <coughs> raised over £100,000 in November. My guess is if we had told them that that's what you're going to do, we wouldn't have raised half that. No. How do you, how do you communicate then to people? Because um, you've got a lot of, how many staff have you got now, roughly? <coughs> well, <laughs> depends on whether you include the personal trainers or not. But uh, excluding personal trainers, about 320, it's nearly 2,000 if you uh, include personal trainers, who are very much part of our team. I mean, that, that's how we see them. So how do you get that sort of your vision or the, the, the company's vision to the people that are working on the gym floor in Leeds or wherever? So regular communication. I mean, the senior team, I've always insisted visit gyms regularly. The Exco team, so that's the sort of senior operational management team um, <clears throat> visit our sites on a regular basis because it's vital you do. If you're the manager in Plymouth or Swansea, the danger is you feel really isolated compared with someone, someone in London or someone near where your head office is. So we insist that those sites get as many visits as everybody else does. And then we have events, we have a fantastic company event every year where we will get feedback from the teams about what happened last year, did it work, was it good? And then we talk about what we're gonna do this year before we do it. So consulting people is the sort of key part of that. And then we have a regional management structure. So for every 10 sites as a regional manager, who will be visiting a site generally fortnightly. Right, okay. So, so just, I just want to go back a bit because I think there's a sort of interesting story. So when you, you, you moved on, you sold your business at Dragons and the industry at that time, I guess where there was a lot of um, what they call, I guess mid-market people like, I guess LA Fitness and um, Fitness First, I, I, I suppose were probably growing at quite a rapid rate. What, what were you, what was sort of going through your mind and, and how did you come up with the idea to bring in a low, low cost model to the UK market? So, um, well, a number of different factors. I mean, clearly there was an opportunity in the UK because by, I mean, at, at one point there were about 10 companies that were listed on the stock market, uh, but the health club market was the sort of blue-eyed boy of the city for a while, um, but that had sort of unfortunately crashed and burned. Um, Was that because they weren't making the money that they thought they were going to? 
or didn't keep on evolving and changing, which is probably another big lesson I've learned that you know, our business 10 years ago is not the same business we run today, and it won't be the same business that we run in 10 years' time. Businesses inevitably need to evolve and change. So they weren't changing. <clears throat> and they'd lost discipline over quality of sites, so they would just open any gym if the opportunity was there. We won't do that. Uh, for every gym we do, we turn down 30 sites. Uh, before we find one that we do want to do. Um, so even though we're opening 15 to 20 gyms a year, um, we still have very strong disciplines about that decision-making process. And then the other problem was gearing. So Fitness First, I think at one point, were covering, uh, had something in the order of half a, uh, 500 million in debt um, to carry. So, you know, interest rates went up. What did that mean? It meant the customer had to pay more or you didn't get your gym equipment replaced. <clears throat> we carry fit about 50 million of debt and we're as big as they were at that point. So we have a very different structure and we, ha we all the time are looking at how we improve and develop our business. Um, so, you know, the whole estate's, you know, been rebranded over the last 18 months. Right. And so you had it, so you, you saw that there was um, probably the people in the market weren't doing as well. So did, at that time then, did you, when you opened this first <clears throat> location then, did you have a very clear vision to say, well, look, you know, we need to, this is our price point. This is the, in terms of the model itself and, and the people. Did, did you kind of have a lot of that worked out in, in your mind before you opened? Very definitely. I mean, I did a lot of research into low-cost markets. Um, I mean, we weren't the first low-cost operator internationally. We were in the UK, um, but businesses like Planet Fitness had been running for a while. Uh, McFit in Germany um, were growing very rapidly in the German market. They were very disruptive. They were turning their markets upside down, just the same way EasyJet, Ryanair, um, Premier Inn, um, you know, Travel Lodge and so on, were doing in their respective markets. And obviously the low-cost retailers like Little, Little and Aldi. We, however, we introduced some new aspects. So, you know, we learned a lot, or I learned a lot from seeing what they were doing and how they were doing it. But I thought there was a missed opportunity in two areas. None of them opened 24-7 in those days. And clearly there's a market for that, but the problem is how do you deliver it? And of course we needed to research that and <clears throat> test things before we actually tried it out on the general public. Um, and then the other big change was online joining. So everybody told me it wouldn't work. People don't want to work out 24 seven. Nobody's ever gonna join a gym online, I was told on countless occasions. Well you know, nearly a million members later, I can tell you they do. Um, but, they, but at the time, you could see that happening, obviously, with low-cost airlines. You know, 30 years ago, if I'd said to you, you're going to go online on this funny thing called the internet and book your airline ticket and then print it out, you'd have said, well, no, I'd just go down to a travel agent. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> so things change and evolve. Um, and our market has just done the same thing. Um, but it needs to continue doing that, which is why I spend a lot of time, that's part of why I was in Orlando last week, it wasn't completely a jolly, it was also to see what are the new things that are happening in the American market. Right. When did you know that you, you were onto something? Because I guess opening a location and having an idea when nobody was really doing it in this market, um, you know, it could have gone, it, it may not have worked. Um, what, what was the point where you thought, yeah, we're, we're, we're on to something here and this, this is... Did you always know that it, it had the potential to be 140, 50 clubs or, or not? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think I could have had any idea that it would grow to that sort of level. Um, and of course, we were inevitably thinking much more short term. So, you know, we opened our first site in Hounslow. Um, but, but did we know that we were onto something? Absolutely. 
Um, Hounslow Open with 5,000 members. Oh, okay. um, so we were getting indications, and they all were joining online. They weren't filling in bits of paper. So we could see a lot of the things that we'd researched were working. Um, and of course, we, we operated Hounslow for a while before we then moved to the second site. At How long was Guildford. that period? Uh, it's about six months. Right. But then we started accelerating much faster because the second site, you know, the, any of the teething problems we'd had at Hounslow had been ironed out by then. Uh, so we then moved, you know, to Vauxhall. Then we tested outside London, um, which was obviously a fairly major move, but we opened very successfully in Liverpool and Manchester. Um, which was another thing we needed to demonstrate that this wasn't just a southern wonder, it worked anywhere in the UK. Um, and clearly, though about half of our gyms are in the south, that is really just because that's where the density of population in the UK is. Um, but we're in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Leeds, Manchester, Birmingham, um, and we have a number of sites in those big cities. Right, right. It's, it sounds like it was a great success story, and, and I, I've, I've not met anyone in business where it's just gone perfectly, but were, were there any, over that period of time, were there any sort of key decisions that you had to make that could have either taken the business in, you know, not quite as successful as what it did, and, and what, what, what were those sort of, I guess, big decisions or crossroads that you, you, you came up to? Yeah, I mean, inevitably, you, you come across issues all the time. Um, what, what were they? None, none that were insurmountable. I mean, to be honest, the finance market was the most difficult thing we had to overcome. So raising capital, I mean, without Bridges Ventures, uh, who were a social fund as well, actually loving what we were doing and the concept and being prepared to back it, we wouldn't be here today. Getting second stage investment when you've got a successful product is by and large quite easy. Right. So ironically, we today, we dictate terms to the banks in terms of on what basis we're prepared to take lending from them. You know, back in 2007, that it took three years before we could raise any debt at all. So that probably was our biggest challenge, was raising capital. And as we said earlier, you know, it's quite a capital intensive business. I mean, typically one of our gyms costs about 1.35 million. But in those days, because we didn't have the buying power we had today, we have today, it was about one and a half million. Right. So, you know, that, that had an impact. People were critical. So being able to find personal trainers and obviously particularly the key quality management quite difficult when you're a new business. Today, we're the only public company in the sector, so people want to work for us. But then, nobody ever heard of us. You know, were we gonna be around next week? So it was more difficult to recruit management in the early stages. So we definitely had challenges. And then, and of course, borrowing money didn't just stretch to bank debt. You know, with gym equipment suppliers prepared to rent equipment to us. Uh, fortunately, we found a new manufacturer, Matrix, who was starting in the marketplace, who were prepared to back us. Um, you know, we still don't use them today. That's all the equipment you can see outside. Um, but again, you know, we'd have struggled had they not been prepared, you know, to help us. Right. Okay. And when people think of low cost, they, they look at price. We had a conversation again earlier about different brands and, and the, the thing that comes into, I guess, people's minds is, well, all it, all it is is they're, you know, just bringing down the price and offering it something inexpensive. But looking for and knowing what I do about your clubs, that's not really, you know, that's one, one element of what you guys do. What, what would you say are some of the, we, we talked about people, um, obviously the, the price is an attractive Thing. But what else is it that, that kind of makes up the secret source of why you guys have, uh, I guess, the number one in, in, this, in, in this market? I mean, there are lots of factors. We, I mean, we covered some of them. Um, I mean, obviously, the quality of the site. So the sites being visually attractive, well-located, 
Generally speaking, we look for sites all on one floor because then we can create a wow factor with the space. If you're on five floors, it's very difficult to do that. And those are the sort of things that will cause us to say, no, we won't do this site. I mean, the product has evolved from an equipment point of view, but it's also evolved from a decor perspective. So you can see here um, colored zones. Our product in the early days, some people thought was a little white, a little um, sort of austere. Um, so we listened to that and we've changed the product. Um, the people I still think is the biggest thing. Um, and we don't just play lip service to that. It's part of why we're changing our personal trainer scheme at the moment, um, you know, which you know, it's, it involves our team doing huge amounts of work to make it happen. I mean, the whole of our senior management team covered 153 gyms last week um, <clears throat> because we needed to talk to the personal trainers, not just send them an email saying this is what's going to happen. So we sent everybody in the business out on, on the road. Um, very few businesses, in my experience, do that. Why don't you think they, why don't you think they, because anyone can come in here and they can shop and it's like, well, you know, let's take these guys on. Why don't, why don't you think it's as, as easy for people to do what you're doing? Well, they've tried. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why, in fact, the low-cost gym sector actually isn't growing that fast. Um, there are two big players who are growing much faster than anybody else. I mean, we opened 44% of all the low-cost gyms that opened in the UK last year, and there's a good reason for that. Yes, you can copy the hard product, you can buy that gym equipment, but you can't necessarily motivate the management can you provide them with the right level of training and so on? So it's much more about what goes on behind the scenes than actually you necessarily see. Right. And that's the same with Disney. I mean, I know, you know, I told you the story about the tail, but you know, the whole their whole ethos is all about what goes on behind the scenes. I mean, if apparently if you work at Disney, <clears throat> you have three months of training before you'll let anywhere near a customer. Um, you don't see that. I, if I was into providing rides, I could copy what they do, but I wouldn't have a clue what they do behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So what, what do you see then going next to the industry? Do you, you, we, we talked about price and ASOS on, in the retail space and how they're now under pressure to bring prices down further. Do, do you see that to remain competitive, the industry is going to have to be even more competitive and more efficient to bring prices down? Or do you think, because certainly following you guys, you seem to almost kind of be going up a little bit in, in, in what you're offering, not, not necessarily in terms of price, but in terms of your proposition. Do, do, do you think it's, you know, it's, it's a case of adding more value or do you think it's simplifying it? And how do you think the boutiques kind of play into this in terms of the industry? So, I mean, as I said earlier, I mean, we're actually bringing the cost of fitting out a gym down. Right. And that has a material impact both for new gyms, but also when we refurbish gyms. So we just do it cheaper, but we're doing it better. So I think I'd, I'd be amazed if somebody saw a Hounslow in day, on day one and here on day one and didn't think this is a lot better. But Hounslow is now the same as this. So. We've evolved and developed the product, but we brought the cost of doing it down. So our property team, team do a brilliant job in terms of using our volume buying power. You know, it's like gym equipment. I mean, we've just renegotiated the gym contract. Um, <clears throat> and each time we do it, we bring the cost of gym equipment down, which just again further reduces the fit out cost. So I think, you know, that, <clears throat> that is fairly key. Do I think membership prices are going to change a lot? They may rise with inflation, but inflation's, as we know, pretty, pretty low. So I don't think there are going to be big changes. I think we will stay as we have always been, the, the lowest priced, high quality, low cost operator. So if you look at most of the other pricing, it tends to be higher than ours. 
and we would, that's exactly where we would want to stay. I think you, you may see cheaper products coming in. Somebody put second-hand gym equipment in and charge less, but we think people would rather pay more for a better product. Um, but we will still maintain our low-cost positioning. Um, how, what do I think about the boutique market? Fun enough, I had dinner with the CEO of Planet Fitness the other day in America, um, and we had exactly that conversation. And we see the boutique market as being complementary. So if you happen to be in the city going to Soul Cycle or whatever, paying 30 pounds for a class, you can also afford our average membership rate of 17 pounds a month to access treadmills, free weight equipment, and so on, which you're also likely to want to access in addition to doing classes. Right. So we find the boutique market actually isn't competitive with the low-cost gym market. It's actually complementary because we don't do the same thing. Okay. And it, and it sounds like a big part of your opportunity is getting people who have never been in the gym before. I can't remember the percentage you said earlier, but there's a, a lot of your members have... It's, it's the first gym they've been in. What, what do you think can be done to sort of get more people interested? Because a lot, a lot of times, and people even I speak to, feel as though they have to be fit even before they come into the gym. You know, there's almost like a, a, a bar of entry. You know, you've got to look in reasonable shape because there's lots of fit people there. How, how are you breaking down those barriers, particularly as, as you've not got salespeople convincing them you're doing a lot of that online, aren't you? So, Ab absolutely, and all of our marketing is all about driving people to our website um, where they can access the gym. And it's interesting, 94% of our members join away from our gyms online. Um, you know, they use their iPhone or iPad in the office at home while they're on the train rather than actually joining in the gym. How, how do you... Um, improve that. It, it, it's something we're focused on all the time. It's all about interaction between people and it's why a big driver behind us changing our personal trainer system so that we can introduce more training and development for personal trainers and the management team to improve the interaction they're giving to the customer. I mean Retention is, has always been the holy grail for this market, um, but we don't get it right. And the key to it is obviously getting people into a regular pattern of exercise. If you can get somebody working out two or three times a week, then they will continue doing it. The problem is getting them to that point. And that's, we're all the time running new schemes. Of course, it, it's one of the big benefits of being an online business. So if you've not been in for a while, our systems track that. And we can do things like saying, why don't you come in for a free PT session, um, where we've noticed your pattern of usage has sort of waned. Um, so, you know, the, the market needs to work at, you know, but a lot of people find exercise not as enjoyable as maybe we'd love them to. Um, but nevertheless, it's hugely beneficial. I mean, I was reading this morning about how actually you can do away with all the sort of blood pressure medication if people just exercise more. Um, and with Brexit going on um, and the pharmaceutical uh, business entering a very difficult time, well, Maybe this is the solution. The other area that is a big thing for me is the government could do so much without it costing them very much. And the big area they could help with is VAT. So in a lot of countries, VAT on a health club membership, doesn't have to be with us, obviously, is zero or 10%. Ours is 20%. If the government just remove VAT from memberships, as they do already for local authority centres, then we'd be able to drop our prices even more. Right. Which would encourage, as we know, prices are a big driver, therefore people would exercise more. 
and therefore you'd have a preventative approach to solving the NHS's problems. Um, it works in America, it works elsewhere in the world. Why are we you know, so backward in that process? Yeah. And you talk about retention. I, I, we had Paul Bedford on a little while ago who talked about it. And it, it sounds like one of the key things in getting people to come back is human interaction. And, and I guess in a lower cost club, there's probably not as many employed staff. And the percentage of people doing personal training is still quite small. How, how do you overcome that with, um, you know, with, with keeping people to come back, giving them that human interaction? Sorry. And I may be wrong about understanding your business, but... <laughs> so two of the biggest misconceptions about our market, firstly about personal trainers. So what people forget about is people give up high-priced memberships and then join us at a considerably lower price and spend the saving on personal training. So our uptake on personal training is nearly double the traditional health club market. Not what you'd expect, certainly not what I expected when we first started, but actually is what happens. What sort of percentage, roughly, if it's not confidential? It, it's getting towards 30%, oh, it's wow. nearly a third, um, which is based on industry stats I've seen is at least double what's happening elsewhere in the market. Mm -hmm. So you've also got that factor. The point. So when I'm talking to investors in the city, I'll be telling them one of the big benefits with our pricing model is a traditional health club spends 30% of its turnover on staffing. We spend 7%. I'm not telling you anything you couldn't find out. However, funnily enough, you get higher level of service in our gym than you will get in any high-priced gym. And the reason is because we don't provide the staff intensive activities that they do. So we don't have people stocking bar shelves, doing swimming pool tests and putting chemicals into the pool, etc., etc. We only have the gym and classes. <clears throat> and therefore all the people we employ are just providing that service. Just focused around the fitness product. Yeah. Right. Right. So actually, the amount of time that we have available from qualified staff is much higher than you would find in the traditional health club. Right. And I, get, would, I guess if I had to summarise what you're doing, then, is, it, is it just being super focused on what you should be delivering? Is that Because it sounds like it, you know, in terms of your replacing equipment, training staff, their efficiencies, you know, they're not stocking shelves. Would you, would you say that one of the sort of, I guess your personal philosophies is just being very efficient at knowing what you, your customer wants? Yeah, it, it, it is. And I mean, when I was doing research, I looked at a lot of the Mintel reports that come out every couple of years. And today they say exactly the same thing they said 10 years ago that about 70% of people who use a health club only ever use gym equipment. So the other 30% is the tennis courts, the swimming pool, the beauty therapy, the food and beverage facility, the classes, etc. But the bulk of it is the gym. So that's sort of what we do. Obviously, we've got change rooms. We will have about 50 to 60 classes as well as we have here. But our main core facility is the gym side of things. So we're focused on, again, what the customer tells people that they actually want. Yeah. Um, and we don't provide the rest. I, I get asked all the time, you know, why don't we have fluffy tails? Why don't we have saunas? Why don't we have steam rooms? I'd love a swimming pool. <clears throat> of course you would, but you wouldn't be prepared to pay what I'd want to charge will have to charge you to put a swimming pool in. I think that probably comes back to your earlier comment about, you know, this passion and, and the sort of business side, you know, is getting that balance right. It's like, yeah, you know, it'd be awesome to have a sauna in here, but then you're sort of, you're not true to that model that's going to make you a leader, I guess, isn't it? No, I, 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 it was probably a, another of the lessons I learned from the early 90s where, I mean, squash players used to think that the whole, if you were a team player, you represented the club. 
<clears throat> you were absolutely vital to that business. What those players never realized or, or accepted was the number they numerically were so small compared with the bulk of the membership. So in those days, you had maybe a 1,000 members. There would be about 50 or 60 who played team squash. And I'm not exaggerating, but those 50 or 60 people thought if they left, your club would fall apart. Actually, the reality is the opposite was the case. But, <clears throat> so, of course, you tried to cater for them, but not to the detriment of the vast majority of your members. Yeah. Um, so that's similar to our attitude to the customer. Yeah. I mean, if you tell me you want 90 kilogram barbells, I'm going to say, well, I understand that, but most of our members don't. And, you know, ultimately, we may not be the right place for you. Yeah, no, I guess knowing, you, you, you obviously know your customer very well, and that's a part of you know, constantly understanding who, who they are and who you want them to be, I suppose, and really focusing on those. Which again, I, I suppose it's, it's simple business lessons, but I, I suppose it's amazing how many people don't do that. And, and it, I mean, it, there's always a question of how far do you take that? I mean, if you go to Planet Fitness in America, I mean, they are just like we are focused on people who are generally speaking interested in developing and improving their health rather than bodybuilding. They have a thing called a lunk alarm. A, a lunk alarm. Lunk alarm. In every, they've got 1,500 gyms in the States. And if somebody whose deltoids disappear into their head appear, people go and push the button and you get this sort of siren going off. Um, because, <clears throat> I mean, that's a really extreme bit of marketing, but nevertheless, it makes it absolutely clear who their customer, they yeah. see their customers as being. Yeah, who they want and who they don't want. Interesting. So, so I guess you're making investments now for the long term. You know, these, these are expensive facilities. And what would, based on the fact that you have to have a bit of an eye in the future, what would be your prediction of what the, the, the business will look like in five years' time? You obviously said that it's still very much focused on being, you know, the, the very affordable and, and, and low, low priced. But what, what else do you, do you think is likely to change or need to change? What do I think needs to change? I think one of the things that needs to change is more of the population need to exercise if gyms are going to continue to be as successful as they can be. So at the moment, about 15% of the UK population do anything. So we've got to change that. I mean, it, there are parts of the world, in Helsinki apparently, 70% of the adult population exercise regularly. Now, if we could get anywhere near that level, the market in the UK would just transform. But forget about Helsinki. We're 5% behind America. We're, f we're at least 7% behind Scandinavia, generally speaking. So getting more people to exercise is important. One of the areas we didn't cover earlier is the other differential we have, which is we don't have a membership contract. Yeah. So you can join for as long as you like. You can, join, you can go outside, join for a day, pay five quid and work out. Or you can join for a month, or you can join as long as you like. And I think part of getting people to exercise more is giving them flexibility. I think there will be much more use of technology um, people being able to monitor their exercise on their iPhone or whatever they use. I think people will want to exercise away from the gym, and I think operators have just got to accept that that's what the customer wants. And we have exactly that attitude. We don't, if, if you want to work out or run or cycle in, when the weather's better and you live in Brighton, Go do it. That's absolutely fine. What's important to us is in October, when the weather gets bad, you come back. Right. And that is our biggest focus. And nearly half of our members joining every month are people coming back to the business. It's why all of our management team are 
partly bonused on member satisfaction levels. So profit, of, of course, is one of the drivers. But the other one is customer satisfaction. If you deliver customer satisfaction as a manager, you get a bonus. Right. <clears throat> and that is what drives people to come back. And, and we know that. On that contract thing, because I've spoke to other people who have businesses, and I guess from an investor's perspective, that sounds quite a risky model where you're not tying people in, and if they've got the freedom to leave, then you know, how, do you, how, do you, how can you predict what future income we're going to get if, if you don't have any contracts? What, what, how did you convince investors to go with that then? <laughs> so I have always been a, a strong um, believer in freedom of, con you know, of usage. Because otherwise, what you're trying to do is create exercise by compulsion. What more way are you going to put people off by saying you've got to do it? <clears throat> and people are adults, and they want that flexibility. So give it to them. A restaurant doesn't say to you, you've got to spend £100 a month with us. They let you come and go. What they do want you to do is come back, though. And that's all part of the service they give. A hotel's exactly the same. There's no contract in a hotel environment. Why should there be a contract for gym membership? It's not appropriate. It, you know, if you buy that camera over there on credit, well, yes, of course you should sign into a contract and agree to pay it back. But health club membership's not like that. Um, so I think removing there will be, I, I don't think contracts will exist for very long, particularly in the UK market where people have had some pretty bad experiences. I remember reading a headline in a newspaper, not people read newspapers these days, but um, a long time ago, um, in Nottingham, about a well-known health club chain who had sued somebody who died of cancer for the balance of their membership. I mean, what bad publicity do you want to give a sector than that? Um, so I think that will disappear. But I think people will want to do more. They will want, you know, if you're traveling, you're in your hotel, you'll want to be able to do some exercise, probably prescribed by us. Um, with one of our trainers, you know, you'll be able to pick that up on your iPhone or iPad or whatever it happens to be. Um, but I think there'll be an awful lot more use of technology in this sector is my view. Right. So a couple of questions before we finish about you, you yourself and John. So running a huge multi, multi-million pound business like you do, what, what does a typical day look like for John? You know, when you get up, what goes on? <laughs> well, people who work with me will tell you I don't sleep. So, um, in fact, one of our investors says it always amuses me. He sends me an email and gets a response, generally speaking, within five minutes. Um, so I, I do, do believe in hard work. I mean, it, it's something I think that just goes with running a business, not just for me, but you know, for our management and so on. But, but it, at the same time, it's important. There are other things in your life, um, family, you know, children, grandchildren, as I have now. Um, so I think, I think you know, having that sort of flexibility. Um, what time so, do you get up in the morning? Then? So I'm very rarely not on my way somewhere by six-ish. Um, but, you know, I also try to sort of find, you know, time for doing other things during the day. But I may still be sending the odd email at 10 o'clock at night, which I, my, <coughs> our HR people tell me I shouldn't do. Right. And I'm sure they're right. Yeah. And do you get time, do you, do you spend time sort of, you know, part of your, your working day, you know, reading, do you read books, listen to audio tapes, anything? Yeah, like I do. I, I mean, I love, love music. Um, obviously, exercise has been a big part of my life. Um, I don't do enough of it anymore, but um, um, I have plans to, uh, to use some of my time now to uh, get back playing tennis a bit more and so on, yeah. uh, and uh, improving my golf swing. Yeah. So, final question, John. So, Escape Your Limits is, is about escaping something that you've, um, you've either, it's, it's a limit that you've personally believed yourself is as far as you can go, or what other people would probably think is a, is a limit. What would be a, a, 
a, an example of where you've, you feel as though you've escaped your own personal limits or something you didn't think was possible? Well, I think you probably touched on it earlier on about the number of gyms. I mean, if you'd asked me when we open Hounslow in 10 years' time, you're going to be running a chain with 150 gyms, I'd have thought you were mad. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I think it, it just shows how actually you just have to forget about those things, albeit it doesn't happen overnight and you've obviously got to sort of work through a process that gets you to that point. Um, but, you know, it was just the same with Dragons. I mean, even then, if you, I mean, nobody was opening 10 gyms a year. Um, we were opening one a year. Um, if you'd said well, you're going to have 20 in 10 years' time, I wouldn't have believed you then either. Um, I can always remember, I mean, Fitness First opening six sites, um, you know, in their second year, and everybody thought it was crazy. But there are people do, who do it even more than we do. I mean, Basic Fit, who are the biggest low-cost operator in Europe, um, opened 80 gyms in France last year and 100 gyms in five different countries, including those 80. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, that, that makes us look pedestrian. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very, very impressive. Well, whatever, whatever, whatever it is, it's a, it's a success, real success story. And I, and I guess it's not, you know, as you say, it's not what it seems on the surface. You know, it's not a nice, painted, colourful, branded gym with lots of equipment. There's some interesting things that, that go on behind the scenes yeah. that, I guess, make you who you are. So um, I, I appreciate your time, John. Thank, thanks for sharing that information. For Great. Me. Good to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.